Want to come talk to me about my landscaping business? I'll be at Applebee's for half price apps, three to six. What does my truck have in common with my home after a night out on the town? My bed is empty and unused. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm out here in dungarees, crushing vajis, and marrying threes. Henry VIII had like six wives and he was a king. I'm already halfway to greatness. My favorite book is the Field and Stream Sporting Vehicles Handbook. My favorite movie is Deliverance. <laughs> No, no. I have a pickup truck for a job I don't even have. Maybe I'll go fishing. Or maybe I'll just go to Giant and pick up some of that vanilla ice cream that has a little bit of a yellow tint to it. And then grab a sixer of Rolling Rock and go to Larry's house to watch Cody Rhodes finish the story. Because Larry's so cheap his favorite Muppet show is Frugal Rock. My pickup truck is best pickup truck. Love me. Love me. And leave me alone. Hi, this is Brian. The giveaway for the Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4 ends this Wednesday, so click on the link in the description and go to go.getentertowin.com slash regular cars. You buy a mug or a digital download, you help support RCR, and someone gets to win their very own 3000 GT VR4. Thank you so much, and back to Nick's video. Welcome to the expired Eden of the American pickup truck. Because this is arguably the last gasp for tradition before big tech and marketing directors walked up to the pickup-lined VFW hall and dropped their hairless family gemstones on the shuffleboard table. Is this a great truck? Well, you'll just have to stick around for that answer, but what I can tell you is that this is an important truck. And not just for teaching you which people are likeliest to spend too much money on wraparound Oakleys. Yeah, this truck looks like it drove through the wall of an Ikea, got lost somewhere in the textiles department, and drove through the mock bedrooms on the second floor to get out. Yeah, it has the appearance of a truck whose pushrods are about to bend like a blade of grass under a steel-toed boot. But, for better or worse, this Silverado is representative of the final era of the traditional pickup truck. Now, of course, it wasn't the only pickup truck to occupy this space in that period. You had your Tundras, your Rams, your F-150s. And they're all part of the same fabric of discourse. But it's a standard bearer for that time just before the 2010s, and the rise of increasingly aggressive tech integration, and designs that took the reverse mullet approach of ever-expanding cabin sizes and shrinking truck beds. In some ways, this Silverado just barely avoids being among their number. It's almost perfectly placed between the traditional and the modern. But does that make it a good truck? I'm the Roman. This is Race to the Bottom. And I'm continuing my search for the worst cars I can find. Let's see if I've learned my lesson after the last pickup. Grill a steak and trucks up here. I believe in a Chevy. 2008 Chevy Silverado, sponsored by Competitive Cornhole. A few months back, I gave a terrible review to a GMC Sierra 1500, and this truck reminded me a lot of that one, albeit in a different way. You see, even in rural Pennsylvania, a lot of the modern pickup trucks, I'm talking the last 10 or 15 years, a, a lot of those trucks are going to stay spotless when one pulls up to a Sheets or a Cabela's, because they haven't touched a trail. They don't really get used for labor. They're an Eagle Scout badge for masculinity. You have a truck. Congratulations, you've achieved manhood. You've made yourself big like you're trying to scare away a bear. Let us celebrate by drinking Pilsners and mourning Dale Ernst. Heart. These big, surface-area-hogging, tech-heavy, American Evangelians are obsessed with the appearance of virility, without concern for whether or not you're still busting full loads. Modern trucks are made for the rearview mirror, to be admired as their past, or to cause lesser vehicles to shrink at the thought of being overtaken by an animal with a lift kit and running boards that cost more than six lifetimes of rounding up to the nearest dollar so a corporation can cheat on its taxes. Modern pickup trucks feel like a designer representation of the blue-collar experience built exclusively for alpha males. And by alpha males, I mean in the sense that they need to go through more rigorous testing before they're ready for the general public. But trucks like this, and yes, like the GMC Sierra, 
they maintained the quiet dignity of the pickup truck in its most sincere form. Trucks that didn't exist to be pampered or worried over. Trucks that spoiled for a fight against the elements. Don't get me wrong, that Sierra was still the worst truck I've driven from an operational standpoint, but if I had to do it all over again, I think I would be considerably less harsh for two reasons. One, obviously, it's really not like all GMC Sierras are bad. It was just that one. And I really can't stress enough how much of an inverse correlation it was between the quality of the car and the quality of the volunteers. Those guys were great. I just didn't love the truck. But that brings me to the second reason I'd probably be less harsh if I had the chance, which is that while it felt mechanically unsound and cosmetically wrung out, it's only because it was being used for exactly what a pickup truck is supposed to be used for. In a very hypocritical fashion, I was docking that truck for not being this super pristine example of an American pickup truck when the entire point of a pickup truck is to be well maintained, but not necessarily well kept, if that makes sense. Because a ship is safe in harbor, but that's not what ships are for, or however the phrase goes. And hey, even in its worst moments, the Sierra felt more sincere than something like a Raptor or even a Rivian, which I did really like, admittedly, but didn't necessarily think was rugged or practical. This Silverado is temporally closer to the modern age than that Sierra was, yet it doesn't feel overwhelmed by the more is more ideology of truck design. Give me the sincerity of a poorly thought out Tinder profile over the polished construction of a serial dater's hinge account. Sure, one is more comforting than the other, but only because you can't see it for what it truly is right away. Chevy Silverado the official truck of blue-collar bros who post thirst traps that quench nothing. Dude isn't posting thirst traps, he's posting dehydration drops. He's single and ready to mingle, but his opening line dries up her wetland so fast it's like centuries of climate change happening all at once. This Silverado runs on a 4.8 liter V8, making... This Silverado runs on a 4.8 liter V8 making 295 horsepower at 5,600 RPM and 305 pound-feet of torque at 4,800 RPM. Fuel economy is, in Tim's experience at least, around 18 to 20 highway, which more or less tracks with EPA estimates of 14 city, 19 highway, and 16 combined. Now, I've heard, at least secondhand from Matt Happel through Brian, that engine up to temp and foot on the floor for five seconds is the only way to get full fuel injector output, and that with tunes, you can get full fueling from rip. I can't say I noticed much of a difference in output when I got this up to highway speeds, but then it's not like I'm on a closed course, and I'm not about to tear up a stranger's truck to satisfy my curiosity. But if I'm honest, I expected this to struggle a lot more than it did. I would love to be able to hate something, because negativity tends to perform better on this platform for whatever reason. But I can't fake hating something, you know? Any more than I can really fake liking something. With that said, I would even take being effusively positive over just being whelmed by something. It's a truck that doesn't reinvent anything about what a pickup truck does, but this Silverado handles and accelerates with this unburdened rural grace. Each turn had me thinking this would be the one where I'd feel the strain of a weathered drivetrain, where I'd start to feel it becoming mechanically compromised, sort of like with the Sierra, where it just starts to feel like I'm in danger, <laughs> you know, as I'm driving this truck. Like, this could literally just go all crazy on me at any moment, and all of a sudden it's like I'm ending up in a ditch somewhere. That sensation of a shopping cart with a busted wheel, you know? But that feeling never came. It was reliable and consistent performance, which is all I really ask for. It's nice if a car does more, but I don't really need it to. Maybe it's because there was nothing weighing the truck down in the bed, or maybe it just speaks to the condition in which Tim, our volunteer, has kept this truck. It looks rough in places, but it was seemingly much worse when he first got it. 
Long story short, this was his grandfather's truck, but once Grandpa became too old to pass a driving test, the truck became Tim's. Rust was eating away at everything, and so this needed new struts, new brakes, new rotors, new driver's side hub. I mean, this basically came with a stack of fresh invoices for everything that needed work. I mean, figuratively, anyway. But it's been used primarily for practical reasons. It's not Tim's daily, so it gets to come out for camping and delivering water bottles and hauling the occasional stack of firewood. It's not heavy-duty work, but then, I don't know if this is really a heavy-duty truck. It's the mid-tier trim, the LT. It's far removed from the type of luxury truck that might as well have been an SUV in the first place. Yeah, this has a larger-than-average cabin, I would say. But it doesn't feel like I'm getting shortchanged on the bed to accommodate it. And looking at the layout, this size still makes sense for what this truck is. And hey, I, I really do try not to be anti-present day. I want to be, you know, fair and honest and open-minded about everything that comes down the pipeline in the modern era. But it's hard not to be a little cynical when a lot of the experience of modern cars is informed by a yearning for a more tactile, simplistically absorbing drive where the less the car has to distract you with, the more engrossing it is to operate. Touchscreens are a pain inside of my asshole. And while I understand the safety benefits of some driver assistant tech, some driver assistance tech, I feel like it also atrophies some of our natural instincts as drivers to where if we were used to driving with those features, then God forbid we ever have to drive without them again because we'll back up into oncoming traffic, waiting for warning beeps that never come, or swerve into a car in our blind spot because we kept looking for a light-up indicator on the door panel that our 2005 Yaris doesn't have. Driver's aid tech sometimes gives the vibe of a video game with microtransactions where you pay to not have to play it, to just have things done for you. I can appreciate luxury and comfort and technology and even occasionally crave it on days when I'm frustrated, but by no means do I feel like I actually need anything special. And I think that's kind of why I like this truck. It's a truck that feels built to spec for exactly the kind of person who wants a functional truck and not a whole lot more. And I don't mean for that to sound like I'm damning this thing with faint praise, but this feels like the kind of truck you hold on to rather than leasing for a few years and then trading in for the latest model with all those creature comforts you're never going to use. Different relationships breed different attachment styles. And the same is true in the automotive world. And it's kind of something I want to explore, if you'll indulge me, because in psychology, there are four flavors of attachment styles, at least if I'm remembering right. It's secure, there's anxious, avoidant, and anxious avoidant. Let's relate them to cars and figure out where the pickup truck lands. So secure is basically what it sounds like. Being vulnerable doesn't scare you, and you're cool with emotional intimacy and being depended upon. You're not afraid of getting too close out of concern for being abandoned. So, in the automotive world, you probably own a Toyota Corolla or a Honda Civic or an LS400. You're not terrified this car is going to crap out on you and leave you holding the bag, checking Facebook Marketplace in a desperate bid to stay out of Kunkelman Chevrolet's finance office. Meanwhile, avoidant is another one that more or less is what it sounds like. I don't want to be close to people because I don't trust them, and having to depend on other people or having them depend on me sounds like hell. I'm independent and, ugh, why do you want to be close to me all the time? I swear she's always on my jock. This is like a Challenger or a Charger or a Wrangler, maybe an STI. You drive a car that is somehow both desirable and off-putting, approachable yet withdrawn, a celebration of the self. I guess you could even put something like a Miata in there, too, like just any kind of sports car. Anxious is worrying you aren't loved, you aren't valued, and your partner is inevitably going to leave, so the idea of getting close to anyone in a truly vulnerable way is terrifying. Yet you want to be close for that reassurance, even if the other person is kind of put off by it. It's being clingy for a sense of safety that will never come because there can be no relief or reassurance in an anxious attachment style that would truly satisfy the doubts in your head. This is owning a Sentra, a Dodge Caliber, or any BMW or Fiat that spills oil like a poorly trained sous chef. We end up with that ever-present terror that this thing could... Really? 
Mute your phone, Nick. There we go. We just have that ever-present terror that this thing could die at any moment or that we're, you know, this thing isn't in our life for a long time. It's like, really? I, I just got paid. What now? What's wrong now? Of course, sometimes this can lead to the car being better maintained because you're anticipating its complete and total failure and want to get as much out of it as you can for as long as possible. But hey, at least you're not anxious avoidant, where you have the worst of most worlds, as the idea of getting close to another person in any sort of emotionally meaningful way leaves you feeling stressed and uncomfortable, even while you're terrified that your partner feels the same way about you. It's your brain convincing you that memories of your past trauma are some sort of natural defense mechanism insulating you against future pain. I'm scared I'm going to be hurt if I get too close. I can't allow myself to depend on this person because what if they leave? But God, I want to be close to them. I, I want that closeness, that intimacy. This can honestly be the experience of any owner with any car. It could be something as ostentatious as a Lamborghini or as simplistic as a Kia Rio. I don't want to invest emotions in this thing or become attached because I'm inevitably going to end up having to replace it. I can't become too invested because what's going to happen? The same thing that happened last time. The same thing that always happens. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe you got into an accident before and don't trust yourself to keep the car alive, or maybe you invested all your emotions and finances into a project car only to have it fail, and you don't want to go through that again. It's a complex situation, and it sucks, and it differs from the anxious avoidance style in the sense that it's already sort of taken as given that things are going to go wrong. Anxious attachment sort of anticipates the possibility of something going wrong, whereas anxious avoidant just sort of views it as inevitable. At least that's kind of my understanding. I mean, I went to grad school for English, so what the hell do I know? Now, in the grid of attachment styles, where do the pickup trucks go? And make your guess in the comments. I, I want to know what you think and if you disagree with this, because I actually do read as much of the comments as possible, even though I don't respond to them all. But that's actually one of the highlights of my Monday, genuinely. So, despite what I've said about the apparent peacocking that goes into owning a big pickup, I would actually dub them the official car of avoidant attachment. Yes, it's built for work. But don't rely on me. Don't ask me to help you move. Don't ask me to haul things around. This isn't for you. It's for me. I have a pickup truck because it allows me to be more me, irrespective of whether or not I actually need the pickup truck. It allows me to do the things I want to do, but also the things I need to do. And look, you can love a pickup truck, and Lord knows many do, but for a lot of pickup truck owners, it's closer to a tool than a member of the family. But the thing about a pickup truck is that it can represent freedom and independence better than a two-seater sports car, better than a sedan or even a muscle car or some other, you know, prototypically male testosterone-fueled option. A pickup truck can take you away from other people, into the elements, into the woods for camping or hunting, and it's a vehicle capable of protecting your individual peace by allowing you to go places and do things you you wouldn't be able to with one of those aforementioned cars. That's what I mean by the pickup truck being the official car of avoidant attachment. But it has other utilities. Maybe it protects your financial future by allowing you to perform the labor required of your job. Maybe it's the flagship vehicle for your own business. Or maybe it's simply something that allows you to construct the version and vision of yourself that you always wanted. To more fully realize the type of life you want for yourself, where you can haul what you want, work on what you want, and not worry about it like a sports car that only gets to come out in warm weather. Obviously, there are people in the world who genuinely need these trucks, not just for work, but maybe because of the conditions where they live. Who knows? What I do know is that being avoidant doesn't mean you don't care. It doesn't mean you want to be alone forever. But relationships take work sometimes. Not every relationship, and not all the time. But some days, you'll be happier than you knew you could be, and others, you're in an argument, and you're getting nowhere, and it feels like they wrote a script in their head about how the conversation was supposed to go, and they're getting mad at you for not being off book. And in those moments, you might want to be alone. But we're not built for solitude. Not forever, anyway. Even in moments of loneliness, we naturally crave connection. 
And sometimes that manifests in the cars we choose. A pickup truck may seem like a solitary vehicle, but even the smallest pickup truck still has a passenger seat. So my closing thoughts on the Chevy Silverado is that despite anticipating not liking it, I actually did end up liking it quite a bit. Cosmetically, it's in rough shape, but you know what? I don't know that I really care about that. I care about operation, and this works well. I mean, it's it's an unburdened, uncomplicated, straightforward truck. I like cars where what you see is what you get, and I think that's mostly what you get here with the Silverado. It's not weighed down by overbearing tech options and all these other sort of excesses of the modern era. It still feels like a traditional pickup truck. Spacious interior, but not at the expense of the truck bed. Decent acceleration for its size. Decent fuel economy for its size. You know, all things considered. So I guess this is just a long way of saying that it's not going to end up on the bottom five list, which, as a reminder, starting at number one, which I like the most out of the bottom five, there's the Kia Forte GT, followed at number two by the Hyundai Tucson Hybrid. At number three is the Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo. Mike, I did get your email about redemption, <laughs> and if I haven't gotten back to you by now, reach out to me again. At number four is that GMC Sierra that I mentioned earlier in the review. It just wasn't a good truck, unfortunately. And at number five, winning the race to the bottom still is that Nissan Sentra because it was just, ugh, mm. I mean, you can go watch the video, but it was just, it looked okay, but it's just, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Not even like a wolf, just kind of like a an old donkey in wolf's clothing. So that'll be it for me. I'd like to thank Tim for offering his car for review. And if you think you have the car that can win the race to the bottom, something that is so awful that there are no redeeming qualities for even a guy like me who likes almost everything, email me at regularcarstheroman at gmail.com. Right now, we can only accept entries from people who are willing to come to us in southeastern Pennsylvania, but I do read every email even if I don't get the chance to respond to each and every one of them. Thank you for watching, and if you could, please like the video and maybe subscribe to the channel. It all helps us out a lot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great week. Pickup trucks are in pickup trucks until you need a move. I don't need it for the job I have, just my need to prove that I'm everything I ever wanted to be. I didn't mean of course I didn't that I have a mighty I'll swear it's me just for you to say you have need of me